Second of Thessalonians chapter 3, that's what we're going to be thinking about as we, we break bread. Let's just start with, uh, with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we again come to you wanting to focus, to focus upon you and upon your dear Son and the things of his kingdom and the things of your Spirit and your way with us. Because, Father, you and your Son and your kingdom and your way are what we want to be our way and the absolute heartthrob of our whole existence. Father, help us then in this brief time of contemplation of your word that truly we might be guided. Direct our hearts, as we will read, into your love. Because, Father, our minds and our hearts are liable to wander all over the place, concerned about so many secular things, and we pray that you will direct our hearts into your love. Father, as we are here to show our membership, as it were, in the body of Jesus, we think of all those others who are in that body, who suffered at this time. We pray that you will be with them, that you will be with us, and that we might all truly believe that it is your good pleasure, it is your will to give us the kingdom. Strengthen us, Father. Forgive us our sins, and above everything, grant us our heart's desire, which is to be in your kingdom. And in our humanity and weakness, we do pray that it will come soon to end the madness of man and the flesh as we see it in this world, to at last establish your Son and his kingdom as King of kings and Lord of lords, when the kingdoms of this world shall be no more, and the heavens and earth of this system will be replaced by your kingdom, and a new heaven and a new earth in which dwells righteousness. Please strengthen us, Father, in that wonderful hope. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I've been talking about the Thessalonians, haven't I, about how Paul went there and preached for three Sabbath days. And that means he was there for just over two weeks. And he says, we, we, we read it, that he worked day and night whilst he was there, lest he be chargeable to any of them. And he says, I worked with my own hands to provide not only for my needs, but for the needs of those that were with me. So he did not have much contact time with them, did he? And yet, because of that basic encounter with the gospel, these people were baptized. And as we saw in chapter one and chapter two, they were going through a lot of tribulation. He was pleased with how they were going. Sure, they had their problems. But you see all the same that a simple belief in the most basic elements of the gospel is so powerful. I mean, we say the gospel is so simple that a child can understand it. Well, in that case, which I mean, that, that, that is true. In that case, then, what, what that means is that, sure, the gospel can be explained in a matter of hours, because that is really all the contact time that he would have had with them. Don't forget, people worked hard in those days. Sabbath was the only day off, as it were, and probably not all day on the Sabbath. And his contact hours with them were, were limited. I don't believe there was a lot of chance during the week for him to meet with them. He said, I worked day and night to just keep myself and those I was with to keep us with food and, and somewhere to live, etc. Presumably he worked, I don't know, on a building site, as a tent maker, possibly he worked as a tent maker, but it would have been absolutely casual work, low-paying work. So, finally, brothers, verse 1, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified even as it is with you. I love the way that Paul always shows his kind of frailty, his vulnerability, and his kind of equality with his converts, because he says, I need your prayers. So many times he says this, I need your prayers. If you take nothing else away from this, don't be ashamed to ask people to pray for you. And, you know, he, he prays that the word might have, he says, well, free course, or that it might run swiftly. And I think that this is an idiom for response to God's Word. You know, David says in the Psalms, may I run in the way of your commandments. So 
The idea is that when you understand, when you hear God's word, you run in response. And I think that's the meaning of that passage in Daniel 12, where we're told that in the last days, knowledge shall be increased and many shall run to and fro. I don't think it's talking about scientific knowledge or people flying around the planet. I think that is sort of uh, literalism's last gasp, really, to uh, take it that way. I think the idea is that knowledge of God's word will be increased and people will respond. Many shall run to and fro in response to that. So, to run in response to God's word. This is a, an idiom, as I say. You, you got it several times in the Old Testament, different places in the Psalms, in Habakkuk, in, in Amos, and so on. And, and here, in 2 Thessalonians. I think the idea is that when you hear the word... You are to respond quickly. I love that in the first few chapters of Mark's Gospel. People are quickly, everything's quick, immediately. This happened, and immediately and quickly they did this or that. The shepherds were told in, in Luke's Gospel that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. They quickly went there. Paul immediately went to preach in Macedonia when he understood the vision that that's what he was supposed to do. And he immediately, he says in Galatians 1, began preaching in his own life when he was told to. So I think that what that means is that we are to respond immediately. That's why the Acts of the Apostles is full of accounts of people being baptized immediately. Acts 2, of course, the same day. 3,000 people said, yes, what must we do? You've got to be baptized. Right, let's do it. Philippian jailer, middle of the night, middle of an earthquake, what must I do to be saved? Believe and be baptized. So he was baptized and his household immediately. So you see there is an urgency and it's that urgency in response to God's word which must continue throughout our lives. Whereas there's something in us that wants to put the brakes on when it comes to anything spiritual. Oh, yes, 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 I shall do it uh, tomorrow. Well, yeah, yeah, a little bit busy today. I'll do it. In fact, this week I'm a bit, a bit busy. Do it next week. Do it now. Do it now. Just do it. I don't like that slogan, just do it, because of course it's irresponsible. But when it comes to God's word, when you perceive what he wants you to do, well, do it. As the proverb says, don't tell your neighbor to go away and come again another day when he, he's in need. Yes, yes, oh yes, I'll, I, I see your problem. Yes, I'll, I'll help you. And it's not right now. The guy needs help right now. Don't put it off. Know yourself. Know yourself. And realize that you in yourself, by nature, or tendency, or whichever word you're more comfortable with, by tendency, you don't want to do what God says. So a little voice in here, or what the Bible calls the Satan, the adversary, the devil, the enemy within, says, eh, yeah, do it, but, but, but not right now. In the hope that tomorrow might never come, in that sense. So he says, I want you to pray that the word of the Lord might be run in response to, that people will respond like you have done. And again, he's very positive about the Thessalonians, because he's going to go on in this chapter to say, look, uh, you know, there's some of you who aren't working at all, you're lazy, and actually some of these people you need to separate from. But he's very positive about them. May, may God's word have response, may people run in response to it, as it is with you. So, he, he says, um, <clears throat> the Lord is faithful, though, verse 3, who will establish you and guard you from evil. Well, here we get into this whole thing of what... God does for us. Establish you. You check that word out in the lexicon, the Greek word that's translated establish you. And it means to confirm, to direct, to turn you around. Remember the proverb, the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord like water, and he turns it whichever way he wants. God can work directly on the human heart. He can work directly on the human mind. The heart is the mind. Okay? And what's another word for the mind in the Bible? The spirit. God can work on your spirit and give you his spirit, the Holy Spirit. As I always say, I'm not talking about miracles, speaking in tongues, raising the dead, so forth. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the more essential change in the human heart. And it is that promise, that promise, the gift 
of his spirit in mine, which is at the heart, I believe, of what it is to be a Christian. And it is actually at the heart of the gospel. And you've got it all the way through. God will not force you. He will not treat you as a puppet so that you are just zapped and made to do against your will. No. He recognizes, on the other hand, that human volition, if you like, human will, the human spirit, is weak. People say, ah, oh, human spirit is very strong. Well, in moral terms, no. People may be stubborn, but you know what it's like. You're weak as water. You face temptation, well, give in. You know, the human spirit is weak. But we want to go, we as believers, we want to go the right way. And God will then confirm us in that path, if that is what we want to do. So the Lord is faithful who will establish you. He will turn you, he will confirm you in the way you wish to go. And uh, it's the same word when the Lord tells Peter, strengthen your brethren, strengthen your brothers. Well, he will do the same. He will strengthen us. And Paul uses it quite often when he says, for example, to the Romans that I, I will finally come and visit you, that I might strengthen you. He wants to build them up. And he does this, God does this through various mechanisms. It could be through people who strengthen or, or, or build you up or, or whatever. So then God would, or the Lord would keep, the Lord Jesus would keep them, establish them, establish their hearts. We're told in chapter 2, we just read, 2 Thessalonians 2, he can establish human minds. So what is critical is your volition, it is your desire. What is your innermost desire? What is your heart's desire? Where is your soul? What do you want above everything? If you want above everything to be in God's kingdom and to do his work and to be his man or his woman in this world, he will confirm you. If this is mere religion, that yeah, I'll go to church, or, well, yeah, I'll so look in the Bible now and again, but actually the driving passion of your life is your family, is your career, is your house, is your kitchen, is whatever it might be, your land, whatever it might be. If that's a driving passion of your life, well, your heart... You've only got one heart. Right? It can be in two places. If the overall passion of your life, the deepest heartthrob, is for God and for Jesus, and for their work and for their kingdom, and for their glory above all, he will confirm you in that way. He will establish you. And he will guard you, and he will keep you. There is this higher hand in human life that, that we so desperately need, absolutely. Well, <clears throat> We're told that the Holy Spirit dwells within us, so that Paul says this to Timothy, to Timothy 1.14, so that Timothy might keep or guard what has been entrusted to him. God wants us to succeed. God is not indifferent. He wants to confirm us in the way to his kingdom. But we have to have that initial desire for him. And you may think, well, where do I get that desire from? From, uh, I don't know, you know. It comes back to this. Do you love God? Do you love God with all your heart? Well, <clears throat> why do you love? Why do children, I'm not talking about romantic love, uh, but why did little children, for example, love their parents or their granny? It is because they first know love, typically, from parents, grandparents, etc. So, for example, granny gives them this, cuddles them from childhood, loves them, gets them prezzies, all the rest of it. Oh, so I love my granny because she loved me. It is not genetic. They may be an adopted child but they still love that granny because she's my granny and she loves me. Rather than loving, for example, the lady who works in the shop or the lady who they happen to have met who lives in the flat next door. We love, as John says, because he first loved us. But what is the definition of the love of God? 
Well, God commended his love to us, Romans says, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And time and again in the New Testament, the love of God is interpreted in terms and in context of the death of Jesus on the cross. God so loved the world, and the force is on the word so, this is how he loved the world, in that he gave his only begotten son. So then, and it's clearly a reference to the cross there, because he goes straight on there in John 3 to talk about as the serpent was lifted up on the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man should be lifted up. So then, the love of God is... The ultimately comes to its ultimate term in the fact that his son died for us. Uh, Jesus himself makes this connection between love, his love, and his death. Told that having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them unto the end, and he gets up and walks out basically to, to crucifixion. So the love of God is repeatedly defined as, in its ultimate term and its quintessence, as the fact that Jesus died on the cross for me. Well, you then go on here to read verse 5, and so may the Lord, and I take that to mean the Lord Jesus, direct your hearts into the love of God. Well, we are here, aren't we, to, to remember him, to remember the cross. And may the Lord Jesus direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. So then we are directed into this love of God. He will work in our minds so that what we are doing now, as we break bread, as we remember Jesus on the cross, we are directed mentally, psychologically, so that we perceive his love there. And if you see that love and feel it, then you love back. We love because he first loved us. He took the initiative, commended his love to us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. The cross was, if you like, the first move. And we respond. So this is why we broke bread. This is why we need to be focused upon the cross. I'm not a Roman Catholic, nor am I Russian Orthodox, so I don't wear a cross around my neck, but that's because I don't like the associations with what I do not agree with and don't believe. But it is true that the theory is right that we should continually live life in the context of knowing his death for me. Hey, walk into a good Catholic's house and there's a cross crucifix over every door yeah well uh, that's right all the time I don't do that because it's a symbol of political Catholic power in, in my opinion but the principle is, is right absolutely that we are to live life in every room in every part of our lives with the, with the cross as it were on your heart on your chest that's the idea that always we have this sense that he loved me. Now we come and take this, this, this bread and wine to, to remind ourselves, don't we, of it. And sure, finally, we have, say, once a week or whatever, something visible and visual to focus upon. But the essence of this should be daily, hourly, in fact, all the time, that I live under the impression of, of his love, that he loved me in this way. This is the slight mystery, I suppose, of how Paul could say in Galatians, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Well, he gave himself for you and for many people. But there is this, and it's a mystery, but it's true. It is to be accepted and it is to be felt that he died for me. And that is where the breaking of bread is so personal, that he died for me. Yes, for you, yes, for for the sins of the world, in, in one sense, the, the world's redemption, but for me. And because of that, we love him. And because we love him, this becomes no longer mere religion. This becomes no mere Bible study club. 
ever seeking to find out new facts about the Bible and checking this interpretation against that interpretation and so on. This is more than that. This is knowing him. That man is not alone. I am not alone. You are not alone. But he loves me and loved me and loves me and I therefore and thereby, like the little child loving granny because granny's got a special number on her and blesses her and gives her sweeties and, and cuddles her and all the rest. We love him back. And yeah, he says, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. This is slightly ambiguous, the, the way the grammar is constructed there. Does that mean that our hearts are directed to love God more? Or does it mean our hearts are directed to the love of God? As in a thing called the love of God, which is, I'm suggesting, above all, the crucifixion. Well, I think it's um, ambiguous, uh, as uh, grammar can be at times in New Testament Greek, because the two things are related. Our hearts are directed to the love of God, which is in Jesus on the cross, his death there. And because of that, there is elicited from us love of God. And therefore, our hearts are directed into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Well, I don't think that's the best translation. The, the Greek really is into the patience of Christ. The idea is that <clears throat> our aim is not so much eternal life for me personally, but the aim is Jesus. This is why we are told that we are running a race looking unto Jesus. So then, Jesus is the end point. There is a subtle difference between that and saying that eternity in God's kingdom is the end point. That is also true. But it is all about relationship. I mean, frankly, if the whole endeavor is so that I shall live forever and cheat death for myself, well, that would seem to me somewhat narcissistic, somewhat kind of selfish, let's put it that way. Um, and I don't think that we have consistently enough motivation. You may be motivated at some points of the day, of the week, of the month, of the year, some aspects, periods of your life where that's a big motivation. But I think the more abiding and transforming motivation is that I am in relationship with Jesus. It's not all about me. It is about him. John Thomas put it another way and said that God manifestation and not human salvation is God's purpose. Well, sure, quite go with that. He was very God-centered. Well, as I see that the New Testament is encouraging us to be more Christ-centered, of course, because he is the way to the Father in, in that sense. But the end, <clears throat> the end of the race is, as 1 John 3 says, when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall be made like him. We are being transformed into that same image, which is the image of Jesus, Paul says, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That is to say that we are progressively being transformed into him. We are being renewed in knowledge, Colossians says, after the image of him that created us. We are taking on his image. And finally, when he comes, we shall be like him. So he says, I pray that the Lord will guide your hearts into the patience of Christ so that his spirit might be yours. And Paul sees the point in praying for other people to have this experience. He could say, well, you know what? You should just pray that you'll have the Spirit of Christ and he'll give it to you. But he says, I am praying for you that you might have it. So you see from that then, thinking about it, that there is an element to which our prayers and efforts for others can have some effect big effect upon their salvation, upon their spiritual growth. If it were not the case, then so much of Paul's writing would be, would be pointless, talking about, oh, please pray for me, I'm praying for you all the time. Well, this would be somewhat pointless if it's actually all just up to you and me, and the man stands alone, facing off against God over an open Bible. There, there is more to it. There are different dimensions. 
Of course, we cannot expect or want even God to just zap a total unbeliever into a believer. That's not the idea. The idea is that we were weak <clears throat> and in the gap between my spirituality and what is required, what should be, you can help make up that gap for me by praying for me. And I can help make up your gap between who you actually are, in fact, and the image of Jesus that should be in you. This is what prayer for each other should be about. So he, he then goes on to, uh, to talk about <clears throat> getting rid of uh, or separating from disciplining, let's say, those who uh, are just missing the whole point of all this and who think that church is all about, oh yeah, I can go there and get a bit of money. It's a rather strange juxtaposition. I mean, he's talking in very spiritual terms. Then it's as if he sort of talks about something very secular, very human. Like, oh yeah, you've got people coming to church who are just coming for welfare money. <laughs> Look, don't have them, you know. But it's purposeful. The sort of disjuncture between this sort of high sort of level of spiritual reasoning and then this sort of mundane thing <clears throat> is intentional because I think his idea is, look, this is what it's all about. But don't waste your time with mere religion and being religious, even Christian, for what you can get out of it. It's not about that at all. So he, he says, um, if a man does not work, <clears throat> then he will not eat. And I think that he is pretty well quoting or alluding to the Midrash, that is the rabbinic commentary on the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden, where he's told you, you shall work in the sweat of your face in order to eat your food. And I think he's saying, yeah, look, that is so. He's saying that, look, the effects of Adam's sin and the reality of living in a fallen world are to be faced and not to be dodged around. Oh, maybe I could go to church and not work and someone gives me money. Oh, I've got round the curse. I shall not work in the sweat of my face. To eat bread, I should just get bread and money out of, uh, out of the church. How about that? I got round it, aren't I smart? And I think from that we can take a principle. Because we live in an age where technology, wealth, etc. have conspired together to try to help people get around humanity so that you don't have to work in the sweat of your face. Oh, look, do this, do that, and then you can retire when you're 35. Oh, I didn't get there, but, you know. Uh, you can retire when you're 35 if you, if you do this. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you just had a great life. You got, haven't got to work again. You have this pension scheme. Live in this, uh, I don't know, apartment complex. Everything's done for you. Meals on wheels. Uh, you know, everything's great. But, no. I think the principle is that the ties that bind cannot be gotten around, as it were. And I think that's the abiding principle that I take out of Paul saying, if a man doesn't work, he shall not eat, alluding to the Garden of Eden and, and Adam, etc. So <clears throat> that's sort of uh, in passing. But 16, may the Lord of peace himself, yeah, Jesus is real, he said, hey, Jesus himself, May he give you peace at all times and in all ways. But in the Bible, peace is nearly always peace with God through forgiveness. And he's saying, may Jesus give you peace and may the Lord be with you all. I think you have to see here the allusion to the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, look, I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you like the students of a rabbi who the rabbi dies or disappears and they're left orphans. He said, I'm not going to leave you like that. I'm only physically, visually going away, but I will be with you. And I will give you peace through the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. That's the idea. And I think that's uh, his, his illusion here. And that's why he, he signs off. In 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is not just a standard sign-off. Grace is charis, the gift of the Spirit. May this be with you all. <clears throat> so then, 
as I keep saying, going through Paul's letters, this whole idea of God working in human hearts, you know, directing hearts, directing minds into the love of God, into having the patience of Christ. It's a major theme, so major that I would say that this is what it is to be a Christian. These people had heard the basic gospel in very short, basic terms, I would say, a few hours contact time with Paul. They'd been baptized, and they were being transformed by the Spirit. And he prays for them that this will continue. And we can almost not see the wood for the trees, that you can know the Bible so well and be so fluent and aware of struggles for interpretation on this passage or that passage or whatever, that you cannot see the basic gospel and you can almost deny its power. These people were largely illiterate. And in any case, even if they were literate, I mean, the scrolls of the Old Testament were in the synagogue. They couldn't just walk in there. It wasn't like a library. Um, and they didn't have much of the New Testament, if any, written. Uh, it may have been the Gospel of Mark, um, which they would have had to memorize, possibly. But they did not have what we have, Bibles in our hands, on our phones, and so forth. And yet you see this radical transformation. You know, they were under persecution. Why endure persecution? Because they believed. And what did they believe? That basic, simple message that they heard. It's a bit like Abraham. You can get the impression that Abraham was getting sort of visions from God every five minutes, but he wasn't. He got a few visions, and he heard a few words from God, and there's no indication that he actually heard more. So in the course of a long life, you know, he probably had not even one hour of listening to God's word. It wasn't, as far as we know, written down. He would have memorized it, I'm sure, and repeated it to his family, and they would have repeated it. But that's all he had to go on. We've got the whole Bible, and we've got it on our phones. You can have it playing through your earphones and so forth. We've got it all over the place, if you want it. And by the way, use it. Use those great opportunities. But the point is, believe the most basic truths. And the most basic truth, as I say, is the love of God. That he died, that Jesus died for me. Of my nature. One of us. But perfect. And rose again. And shall come again. And establish his kingdom. And I shall be there. And live forever by his grace, because it's all scribbled, it's all forgiven. All the barriers between God and me are gone. They're forgiven because of him. Let's thank God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread in which we see the symbol of the body of Jesus. Given so freely for us. Father, please continue to direct our hearts into your love. So that our hearts might be full of an awareness that you love us and you love me so that we might respond and love you with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind. For Jesus' sake, amen. Again, Heavenly Father, loving Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus to thank you for your love and to pray yet again that you will direct our hearts into your love and into the patience of Jesus. May we have his mind. May we have his patience, his love, his spirit, so that this cup that symbolizes his life, his blood, might become real for us in that his life and his spirit is lived in me and that my life is his life. Hasten, Father, our maturing, our perfection, our completion. Help us to respond more quickly, to run in the way of your word, especially as we see it in the Lord Jesus. For his sake. Amen.